Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 10 a.m. session in the developer, developer and open source track. As a reminder to our in-world and web audience, you can view the full conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org and tweet your questions or comments to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC14. This hour, we are happy to introduce a terrific session called Scaling Open Simulator Inventory Using No SQL. Our speaker today is Tranquility Dessler. David Dashler is an object-oriented software developer architect with a wide range of experience in software and hardware solutions, and is currently a partner and software architect for InWorlds LLC. Welcome all, let's begin the session. Hello everybody, thanks for uh, stopping by and checking this out. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, um, we're going to be talking about NoSQL and specifically uh, Apache Cassandra. And um, we're going to talk about how we can use that to make sure that um, your inventory services stay up and running uh, during a variety of bad situations that would normally bring down uh, server. So um, who the heck am I and why should you listen? Um, again, my name is David Dashler. Um, we've designed a lot of systems on our end to try to uh, mitigate scaling issues uh, that we've run into as our grid has grown. Um, everything from an LSL compiler and a virtual machine, uh, physics, physics integration. Um, also designed a scale out uh, asset service that's now running over 11 servers and holds about 10 terabytes of data. And uh, our inventory system, which is also running on top of Apache Cassandra, running on eight nodes, uh, holding about 250 gigabytes of inventory data. So we're holding a lot of stuff. And so we've run into a lot of problems that uh, I'm hoping that I can uh, assist you to avoid by uh, going straight to these systems that we ended up having to go to anyways. Uh, so we routinely handle over 300 concurrent users on the grid. We peak out just shy of 500 concurrent users uh, without experiencing backend faults or load issues, which um, we obviously have monitoring and everything on. So I get the awesome 2 a.m. call if uh, anything goes wrong. So most of the implementation stuff that I've done is to make it so I can get sleep. So uh, trust me when I tell you that this stuff, uh, a lot of it's working very well for us. So we've experienced and conquered uh, more than a few scaling problems. And uh, I really just want to share some of our experiences with you guys so that uh, you have a chance to sort of just skip over some of the bad times that we've experienced and go straight to um, running a grid the way that you want to run it. So why do we need to worry about inventory? Well, you're running an open simulator grid, everything's going great, but then you get 150, 200 people online, they all want to have 500,000 items, they want to uh, make sure that, that they can uh, carry 10 copies of primitive, you know, times 100, times 1,000 as they go along. Um, people don't really clean out their inventories. They say they do, but um, most of the time there's a lot of uh, inventory cruft and items everywhere. So you're going to have to deal with the fact that inventory is basically a system that's going to keep on growing without bounds, and uh, you need to be able to deal with that. So um, you may start to see people complaining that they can't log in because their inventory gets too large. Uh, you may start seeing at MySQL timeouts where um, they uh, can't open a folder, things like that. Um, there's just all sorts of stuff. And then, of course, their pony avatar may go missing, and we all know that that's a huge problem. So uh, we want to make sure the pony avatars stay in the inventory where they belong and are accessible at all times. So um, that's why we're looking at... Uh, systems that go a little bit beyond the scalability of MySQL, and uh, that's why I'm here. So Federation. Um, Hypergrid does help you a bit because uh, normally the people that are going to be visiting your grid uh, are going to come from a variety of other grids where the inventory backend services are going to you know, be powered by those other grids that they're coming from, but it does not help when your grid gets huge. So if you're the one that is... Um, if you're the one that's that's powering a ton of inventories, you have a lot of users coming on and then they're going to other grids, your inventory services are still going to need to service them. So trying to predict growth and loss and sharding your grid off into your grid one and your grid two and your grid three, four, five to start balancing that inventory back end load, it's just not going to allow you to, to move very fast. It's going to be difficult. You're going to basically scale out that way. You're going to have to keep duplicating what you've already done, putting up more and more duplicated servers and more and more duplicated zones. And uh, so I think that NoSQL in these situations with its uh, ability to scale out so well is a great way to uh, you know, ease your administration and make it so that you have a good solution um, that starts and uh, can continue into the future. Um, 
we're going to talk about shard keys a little bit, but basically when you need to split things between multiple servers, uh, keys have to be chosen that split up the data evenly between all the servers that you have. A lot of times you can um, split um, inventory data. You could shard that between four uh, MySQL servers depending on the user's UUID, for example. So the, the first quarter of the 128-bit number goes here, second quarter goes here, third quarter goes here, fourth quarter goes here. But then what happens when you need to add another server, right? Well, you need to manually shard your MySQL solution again, and that's just kind of a pain in the butt. So um, luckily, uh, systems like Apache Cassandra sort of help you out with this. They do the sharding automatically. So what about MySQL read slaves and MySQL scale out? Um, well, so MySQL does support read slaves out of the box. So you can set up a MySQL master and all your writes are going to that master. And then all those writes get replicated to slaves and you can use those slaves for reads. So um, your slaves are uh, just become read slaves. Basically all your reads go to those and the masters use specifically for writes. Well, what's the problem with this? Where does it start to run into a, an issue? So th the issue is that the writes become the bottleneck for your master MySQL server, MySQL server, at which point uh, all the slaves have to be scaled up with better hardware. You have to remember, if the master can't take the writes, neither can the slaves if they're the same hardware. So now you have to scale up the entire cluster, and uh, you can only do that so far. Scale up doesn't buy you forever. Uh, it only gets you so far, and that's what companies uh, like Facebook, Google, Amazon realize that the solution is to scale out to many, many servers to handle that load. And to do that the right way, we want to use good, uh, good protocols, good algorithms, and distributed systems are complicated. So uh, what is there uh, out there? So um, once we hit those bottlenecks on our MySQL cluster, and you're starting to see those writes that are failing and... and um, starting to see lots of latencies. One solution is Apache Cassandra. And so Apache Cassandra is this really, really cool solution that's um, based on uh, Dynamo, which was designed by uh, Amazon. So we'll go through that. But Cassandra is in use by Constant Contact, CERN, Comcast, eBay, GitHub, GoDaddy, Hulu, Instagram, Intuit, Netflix, Reddit, The Weather Channel, and 1,500 other companies that have active large data sets. So that's right off their website. That basically means this thing is proven, and people are using this at massive scales that you and I probably have never seen. Maybe some of you guys out there have seen it, but these are huge companies that are taking a lot of writes and a lot of reads. It's a distributed scale-out fault-tolerant database with tunable consistency. What does that mean? So um, distributed means that your data is going to get distributed amongst all the nodes that you put up. It scales out. So again, the note you can uh, increase your throughput by adding more servers. Fault tolerant means you can lose an entire server. We're not just talking about a RAID failure. We're talking an entire server, like uh, let's say somebody in your data center is wrestling with somebody else and they bump into uh, one of your servers and it falls off the rack and explodes. Uh, Cassandra doesn't care. So the benefits uh, of this, again, your data is replicated on multiple servers. You can span different data centers. You can lose one or more servers in a cluster, depending on your replication factor, and you will have zero downtime and no data loss. That's pretty cool. You can also um, see the load on, uh, if you see the load on your cluster increasing, it's really easy to add um, servers to handle it. So you don't have to necessarily uh, add multiple servers. Let's say you see a hotspot and you want to add a single server to take care of it, you can go ahead and do that. Yes, Cassandra is like the honey badger. <laughs> so um, now I hear you saying some of you, but wait, Cassandra is eventually consistent. What about acid? And I'm not talking about the drug. I'm talking about acid as far as it comes to um, uh, databases, where once you write data, you get a nice, reliable, and consistent view of the data. And uh, you can basically guarantee that what you've written is readable right away. Um, well, I'd hate to break it to you. I really don't. But uh, a traditional RDBMS scale-out solution with a single master and one or more slaves is also eventually consistent. What do I mean by that? I'm not lying. I'm serious. So in a MySQL setup, you can uh, take a look at what's called slave lag. And what this is, is when you have multiple servers um, that are uh, handling reads from a MySQL, MySQL uh, master, you have lag time between the time that your writes hit your master server and then appear on the read slaves. This lag time is variable. It depends on the load and a lot of other things. And some people will tell you that slave lag is a real pain in the butt once it starts going up. So somebody may write an item to their inventory and then try to res it right away. 
And guess what? If you're not aware of how slave lag works, that, that read is going to fail, and they will not be able to res it maybe for a second or two, um, and they're going to get confused. So that's um, pretty much why if you're going to start scaling out to multiple servers, it makes sense to look at something that was designed 100% uh, from the start to handle uh, scale out and distribution. So uh, Cassandra has tunable consistency, consistency and can offer better guarantees uh, to get a consistent read than a traditional scale out RDBMS. We can tell Cassandra to write to a set of nodes and not return until a quorum of them, like uh, basically a majority of them, have responded that they have written the new value. We can also, again, read at quorum consistency, and we are guaranteed to see the most up-to-date value. No slave lag. How cool is that? So we totally bypassed the issue of slave lag, and we're using a distributed system that was 100% designed from the beginning to handle these problems. So a uh, little bit of a background. Again, I mentioned Dynamo before. Cassandra is based on Dynamo. So Dynamo was invented uh, by Amazon in 2007. Uh, it's a solution to provide a highly available distributed data store. So Amazon, we know they're really huge. And like, so they go down for a minute and they lose like half a million dollars or a million dollars or probably more. I'm probably underestimating. It's probably like 10, 20 million dollars. So um, this is the type of uh, activity that these systems were written to uh, take into account. So when we're talking about using it for inventory, uh, unless your grid is like twice the size of SL, you're never even going to hit the amount of uh, usage that people like Amazon, people like Google, people like Facebook um, have used these type of solutions for. So the Dynamo paper has a few important implementation details Cassandra borrows from. Uh, data is automatically sharded based on a consistent hash of the primary key and it's replicated to n hosts in a hash ring where n is configurable. So let's say you want to make sure your data is always on at least three servers at a time. Um, you can do that by setting your replication factor to three and then it makes sure that your data is written to three separate servers. And you can even do it uh, in different data centers if you're concerned about a meteor strike or something on your current data center or you know, uh, flood and people boating through your, through your servers. Um, this will handle it for you. It, aut it can automatically replicate to other data centers. Uh, it also borrowed from Dynamo Hinted Handoff, which uh, helps bring the data set into convergence during temporary failures. So that means that a node goes down temporarily. Like, so let's say you take it down because you need to do an operating system upgrade. Now, remember, you stay up the whole time, and then when the node comes back up, uh, it gets these hints from the, other, uh, um, from the other nodes that tell it, hey, you missed these writes. Here they are, and it comes, to, it comes back to consistency rather quickly. It also gives you... Uh, the ability to add and remove storage nodes without interruption of service. This is so cool. So, um, again, operating system upgrades, uh, you know, any hardware failures, or even uh, you just need to add more nodes because your load has gone up. This is your. This gives you 100% control without having to worry about downtime. So, cool stuff. So, just to explain consistent hashing again, I'm not going to dwell on it, but here it is. Uh, you have four nodes: A, B, C, and D. Um, each of the nodes, A, B, C, and D, if you had a replication factor of one, let's say you only wrote the data to a single node. Each of these nodes would then have 25% of your data. So 25, 50, 75, 100, easy math there. Um, and that's how uh, Cassandra is going to automatically shard your data. It's going to make sure that these nodes are evenly loaded, uh, and that's what consistent hashing, and uh, this is called a hash ring, and that's what it's all about. Again, this is um, one of the things uh, that Cassandra borrowed from the Dynamo paper, which is pretty cool. So um, we talked about Dynamo. We talked about consistency, eventual consistency. I'm not going to get into cap theorem, but that's pretty cool, too. You guys should definitely take a look into distributed systems. They're awesome. Um, so we're going to talk about using quorum reads and writes to achieve, achieve consistency and partition tolerance. Now, don't get too uh, worried about this. I'm telling you about all the internals about how it works so you kind of get an idea, but the code's like way simpler than, than how the system actually works because there's a lot to swallow here. But once you start to see the code snippets, you're going to understand. So don't worry if you're, if you're kind of lost on this stuff. It's, it's definitely under, it's something that you want to understand to run a Cassandra cluster, but it's not required for you to be able to develop against it. So uh, when you read or write to and from a quorum of nodes, you get a consistent view of the data and you'll be able to tolerate a node or network outage. Okay, so an example is a quorum of two out of three nodes that form a majority. So let's say we write the message uh, A and C to uh, hello to nodes A and C, and then node A dies. So one of the nodes that we wrote, a, we wrote hello to is now gone. 
But Cassandra doesn't care because we're going to read at quorum and we still can read hello from node C and stay running. Now, B's not going to have that right yet there because we only succeeded to get it to A and C. But um, that doesn't matter because we still have a source of truth at C and uh, you're going to get that value back. So this is sort of a very simplified view on how the uh, how it all works and how it can stay up and running. And uh, so there you go. So um, consistency is pretty cool. Um, we can we can do tunable consistency with Cassandra too. If it's not super important that you are able to write and then read the same value right away, you can even write to a single node, and uh, your write will come back after a single node. But then that node will, in the background, replicate that data to all the other um, nodes that are responsible for um, that data. So um, uh, simple Cassandra setup with Docker. So we're going to go and uh, take a look at how we'd actually code against this. Um, oh, I have a question. If A dies, how do you know that C is the truth or B, since it's a 50-50 belief of truth? Um, because we know that we wrote to um, two nodes to begin with, so we know at least one of them has has the actual uh, value that we're looking for. So um, it's not like they're going to... Um, Cassandra also has timestamps that it uses. Like if you wrote a second value overwriting that row, um, Cassandra would use timestamps to um, figure out who wins. So like if I write to A, B, and then, and then A, C again, um, and A dies, and it reads B and C, then it's going to get uh, the newest value from B. So, so as long as we're writing to a quorum and reading from a quorum, we're always going to get truth, even if one of the nodes goes down. Um, and you can stay running like that, too, in a degraded form. It, you are degraded a little bit because, obviously, there's less nodes um, taking the reads and writes. But then as soon as you put another node up, it's actually going to either bootstrap itself or fix itself to be consistent with the nodes that were that were. Uh, up at the time when uh, that node went down, so uh, it does it fixes itself and it's it's all pretty cool. Like I could I can sit here and talk about this all day though, and I <laughs> unfortunately uh, um, I think I have a few more slides left and then we start going through some of the the questions and stuff. Um, so simple Cassandra setup with Docker. Uh, if you haven't heard of Docker, you need to check it out as well. Docker's really cool. It's like it's like a packaged virtualization. Uh, it allows you to run basically applications. Uh, package an app and all of its dependencies into a portable container and then you take that container and you can ship it to production you can ship it to uh, a data center and uh, everything works really well so um, Docker's cool it lets us spin up really fast clusters so if you want to test out a Cassandra cluster an easy way to do it is uh, by going to github.com slash tober slash Cassandra Docker and um, you can actually pick up uh, something that'll allow you to really quickly build uh, a Cassandra um, ring. Uh, by the way, uh, this is done by Al Toby. He's an awesome guy. He works for Datastax. So they're, they're the people that um, really have put a lot of time into Cassandra and, and their uh, customer support's awesome. They have a startup program. You got to talk to them if you're going to use Cassandra in production. They're, they're really, really cool. Again, that's Datastax. And uh, follow Al Toby on Twitter. He's always talking about something really, really interesting. <laughs> Um, once Docker is downloaded and set up, you can start a single node Cassandra cluster by just uh, typing a few commands there. You see docker run dash d dash v serve Cassandra. And, um, I think that version, that 2.0.10 at the bottom, is now 2.0.11. Uh, He's uh, updated, I believe, uh, that package. So alternatively, if you're on Windows, just grab the latest release from Cassandra and run Cassandra.bat. I'm pretty sure uh, that on, that will just start up without really having to do any major configuration at this point. So um, you can also just grab the, the release from Apache if you just want to run a single node and, uh, and get started. So... Um, that's how we sort of uh, can spin up a cluster. Now, once we have a single node or multiple nodes going, then what we really want to do is start coding. And so the code, you're actually going to see it. Uh, the language is called CQL. It's like SQL, but it's a little bit different. So originally, uh, Cassandra made its debut, and you had to access th and read and write values uh, with thrift calls. And thrift using those uh, was like accessing a huge hash table, and you put the values like basically into a dictionary and then you sent that dictionary over the wire and then Cassandra like figured everything out based on the dictionary that you sent over. It wasn't the easiest way to do things, uh, but once you got used to it, it wasn't too bad. However, they designed CQL so that everybody that's familiar with SQL uh, can jump right into Cassandra development. So it's pretty awesome. Um, so uh, things to remember though, when you're developing in CQL, 
uh, there's no joint, there's no group by, okay? So there's a few reasons for this, and we'll go over them, but dating Cassandra is expected to be mostly denormalized, okay? So this is, we're not talking about normalized data sets. Cassandra writes are extremely fast, way faster than reads, and it mitigates the extra write penalty for writing something twice. You're gonna um, notice that Cassandra supports compound keys, and the data that is inserted with a compound key is grouped together by the partition key, and this is super duper important. So that means you can write a very wide row in Cassandra and read that row back. Basically, it's not gonna be a single seek, but it's not gonna have to seek for every uh, sub column in the row. It's gonna read the whole thing together, and that makes even running on a disk really fast. So we're gonna keep that in mind. You cannot use a where clause to filter on columns that aren't part of the row key or secondary index. Partition keys must be queried using the equal operator or in statements. So you have to remember that you can't just go, I wanna select um, everything from the inventory where the name is primitive, right? Uh, you can't do that. Cassandra's not gonna go and troll through 200 gigabytes of tables to go and try to find you that unindexed value, okay? It has to be indexed. So if you need to search by something, you have to remember that as part of your design. It's gotta be indexed one way or another. So it's either gotta be part of the uh, primary key or it has to have a secondary index. These rules and features, they keep you from shooting yourself in the foot so that you're not doing a whole entire data scan, uh, you're not doing table scans. Um, so a question, what kind of data could you move here? Uh, anything. Um, Cassandra doesn't like super duper wide rows. Like if you're inserting multiple megabytes of data, you're gonna wanna split those up uh, into chunks. But once you do that, you could definitely store assets on Cassandra. You could store your um, primary um, data, like uh, user data, everything, anything you want. And they even have, they have ways to update data atomically. Um, you have to go through the docs to, to make sure that um, everything that you would need would be there. But uh, it's pretty much, um, at this point, CQL is pretty much able to do anything you could possibly think of. They even show demos of um, transactional, like uh, financial stuff in, in Cassandra. So um, they, they definitely have a very wide range of uses. Um, so things to keep in mind. Uh, SL viewers, they do not request subfolders individually in inventory fetch. The protocol can do this, but Instead, all folders and subfolders are retrieved as part of the skeleton during login. So when you log in, the server's sending you the, basically a list of all your folders and subfolders and everything is there and that's, that's what the viewer starts with. So even though when you open a folder it has subfolders, the viewer already knows they're there. It's not getting another fetch from that. So we're gonna keep that in mind because it's gonna be important when we design the, the query and everything. Um, all items inside an individual folder are requested at once. We wanna optimize reads based on this fact and not turn every item into an individual random IO. That would be bad, we don't wanna do that because we're gonna be able to get really high, really fast speed out of this if we make sure that when somebody requests a folder, all the items come up in a single query and uh, not have to do multiple queries and also not have to force Cassandra to do all sorts of uh, jogging around the disk. Even though most people that use Cassandra will recommend SST. So. Uh, we can use a compound key to achieve um, not having those random seeks. Items are resident in the world based on their UUID. This gives me a sad face because it does create one extra table for us in our implementation. So therefore we need to map item IDs back to their parent folder ID. So when you go to res something um, that we have, we know exactly what folder it's in because in this design, the folder itself actually holds the item data. That's a little weird cons uh, considering where you come from with SQL, but I'll show you how that, that works. Uh, we do this explicitly and avoid secondary indexes, which seem to have issues with becoming stale and a couple other things judging by mailing list traffic. So I avoided secondary indexes, which would have uh, allowed us to not have another folder there, um, just because I see, every once in a while I see things pop up about them. So maybe there's still an issue there, I'm not sure. All folders have version numbers that get incremented when items or subfolders are changed, created, moved, or deleted. And we'll use a special CQL column called a counter. So um, uh, Cassandra does have support for um, keeping track of a version number or keeping track of uh, you know something that's incrementing. It's called a counter, it's built right in and uh, easy to use, so that's really cool. We don't have to read the old value and write the new one, in other words. Uh, Cassandra will be able to increment the value for us. So this is what our schema looks like. You might have to zoom in. Um, I just wanna talk about this quickly. A few things that you'll notice is our data types. We have a native UUID data type, an integer data type, var char, var car, however you wanna say that, uh, data type for text. We have a Boolean data type, 
And um, then you'll notice the big thing on this is the primary key, right? I talked about that. That's going to keep, especially in the folder contents, that primary key having the folder ID and the item ID be part of the key is going to keep the items grouped with the folder, okay? So whenever we pull, a, whenever we ask for just the folder ID, we're also going to get all items in one fell swoop. That's a single real fast return. Uh, we're not querying each item individually. Um, that's going to make things really beautiful for us and make things quick and keep them fast. Um, we also have, you'll notice we have a skeletons table. That's the initial folder skeleton that you download. Um, we're keeping track of whether it's a root, a top level, or a leaf folder. That allows us to prevent the creation of multiple top level folders that confuse the crap out of the code when it's looking for what folder to put a texture or something else in. So w only on the initial create will we allow something to create a root or a top level. Therefore, it also prevents the uh, viewer from going absolutely crazy and uh, inserting multiple root folders. I've seen that happen too in the past, and this is all designed to mitigate those crazy things the viewer likes to try to do when it doesn't think it has the right view of the inventory, which is awesome. Um, folder versions, that's where we're tracking the folders. Um, and again, uh, this is the counter column I was talking about, so that's the folder version. Uh, so each, unfortunately, we couldn't put that counter into the skeleton. That's where it really belongs, but uh, Cassandra does not allow you to put a counter column on a non-counter um, table, so we had to do it this way. So item parents, um, that's that reverse mapping between the item ID and the folder ID so that we can find the item when somebody goes to res something, which is actually a low runner case, believe it or not, compared to uh, inventory downloads, because everybody loves to clear their cache which is awesome too. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of stuff that's awesome. So uh, a bit more detail about the design. Again, note that the, the schema is, is, is geared around how the data is going to be queried. It's not geared around the class model, OK? This is a little bit different for everybody that's done probably SQL designs in the past until you get to a certain scale and you need to end up sharding the tables off anyways. But um, the, the actual. Uh, the actual data set is designed around how we're going to query it to be most efficient. So you'll notice I'm making a big deal out of this primary key thing being uh, you know, multiple uh, columns. We have a partition key and a clustering column. And again, we're using this primary key due to the way Cassandra stores data. When you use a uh, compound primary key, all the data matching the first component in the compound key, known as the partition key, is grouped together on disk. This means that when we query using this key alone or with this key of the range of clustering columns, Cassandra is able to retrieve the data without seeking out each individual row for the clustering columns. So uh, once we have a folder ID, we also can very efficiently, we also can very efficiently um, get every single item in that folder, which is what we want because of the way that the viewer is going to request the items from the folder anyways. So uh, we, we've designed around the way that the viewer pulls the data. Uh, we've designed our schema around trying to be the most efficient that we can. So, so I'm going to show some code examples, uh, but first there's a few things to remember. Uh, and that's since we're maintaining a denormalized data set, we want to make sure updates to item and folder parentage and versioning are reflected in all related tables. So um, we can make these queries via batches. As of Cassandra 1.2, and right now uh, the recommended version I think is two, for production is 2.0.x, um, so as of 1.2, batches are atomic by default, which means there's less of a chance of inconsistency slipping. And because one thing with these systems is because we've broken these tables out, if normally maybe this would be two tables and it would be really hard for an inconsistency to slip in, like where the folder, the item doesn't belong to a folder anymore, but it mar it's marked as belong to the old folder and things like that. Um, because we've, we've denormalized this data set, we have to make sure that things stay consistent and, uh, you know, so that everything stays running good. So. Um, what we're looking at is uh, Cassandra 1.2 batches are atomic, so we can make sure that um, when we update, you know, three folders at a, or I'm sorry, three tables at a time, uh, that all that data either goes in or isn't executed. So it's either all or nothing, and that's cool. It's Cassandra 1.2 uh, guarantees that. And remember, so just a few things to remember about the design: moving a folder requires you to alter the skeletons and update the folder versions table. Renaming a folder requires you to alter skeletons, folder contents, and folder versions. Now you're like, oh my gosh, you know, these are simple uh, single queries in SQL to do this. Why is this so complicated? Well, remember, this is denormalized, and also remember that um, we have uh, we have a few tables to worry about, but it's cool because the writes are super fast in Cassandra. We don't have to worry about those extra writes being slow. They're super duper fast. Uh, deleting folders and items requires hits to all associated tables. Moving or renaming an item requires you to alter folder contents, folder versions, and item parents. Okay, so that's just some of the technical details. All right, so this is CQL, real quick. Um, 
yes, you can bundle all requests to be atomic except for the ones with the counters because, again, for some reason, counters are special. So uh, counter increment cannot be bundled uh, with other statements that don't touch counters. So when we do counter increment, it's always going to be by itself, but that's okay because if the folder version uh, is, is slightly inconsistent um, for like a millisecond or something, uh, that's probably not going to be much of an issue. And actually in production for us, we've never seen that become an issue. The folder version is usually, it's only used by the viewer when you say you like log out and then you log back in, the viewer gets the skeleton and it wants to know like what folders it needs to refetch. That's where that counter is going to be um, come into play. So that's when you're going to need that counter. Um, so it's very unlikely that um, that single non-atomic write is going to cause an issue. So we have uh, some CQL examples here. Um, so you'll notice if you look at this, it's pretty familiar. Like it looks very much like SQL. Uh, insert into folder contents and then the list of columns and then values and then we're binding to that, we're preparing it. And then you'll notice the only thing that's different really with this is that um, folder attributes, insert statements, set consistency level quorum, okay? So that means we want to write to, say, two out of three nodes and make sure before, before that write returns, before it comes back to us and says everything's okay, it's gone to at least two out of three nodes, which is cool, okay? So um, Cassandra will actually usually write to all three nodes, uh, but if one's down, if there, as long as there's at least two up, we're good. So it'll return that, and that write will be considered successful. Um, so that's that's your a little bit of um, CQL, and there's a, another slide with a little bit more CQL in there. Um, but remember, to insert a folder, we need to insert into skeletons, folder versions, and folder contents. So this is the batch I was talking about. And this batch is going to be atomic from 1.2 on. So you'll see that we have, and I didn't list out the the CQL because it was it's too big. It doesn't fit on a slide. So we got batch equals new batch statement, and then we're adding the two insert statements. Those are going to get um, uh, executed atomically. So either both are going to happen or neither. Then we have a version increment, which um, that's what I was talking about with the version increment has to be separate. So I, I bundled that version increment into a function, and that's just going to execute another uh, CQL statement. So you'll notice we were able to do two of those in a batch that, keep, that keeps the skeleton and the content uh, consistent, and then we do the version increment at the end. And you're going to see that pattern throughout um, the code. And yes, all this code's available online, and uh, the last slide actually has the uh, URL and everything to GitHub where you can grab this and then start playing with it. Um, also, I'll, I have um, everything's unit tested in there. You can see that it works, and you can almost grab it and start running with it right away, except for integrating it into your uh, Open Simulator installation. So uh, what's up with version ink? Like I said, we can't include a counter table as part of the batch uh, with non-counter tables, so unfortunately we need to increment the counter separately. and um, so this is how you actually um, do an increment statement. So again, here's a little bit more CQL. You can prepare, update, uh, folder version, set version equals version plus one, where user ID equals, uh, you know, and folder ID equals question mark, which means that we can fill those in. Again, set consistency level quorum. So that, that shows you how the version increment works. And again, it has to be separate from the other batches because it's incrementing a counter and that's, uh, counters are special. So, um, I am, uh, I guess we have 13 more minutes. Uh, so this is the part where I ask you for questions uh, and I'll answer them as best I can uh, about Cassandra and implementation stuff. Um, so go ahead and if you have questions, I am, I am watching. Um, and again, this is a really good solution for um, just about anything you wanna do that you know you're gonna need to scale up. A lot of grids, you know, if, if it's just in your house and you're, you're using it, um, to be a hypergrid port and you're not expecting to get thousands and thousands of users. Um, you probably don't need this stuff, but if you think your grid's gonna get big, sometimes it's good to be prepared. <clears throat> okay, question from Justin. Uh, how long did it take you to implement your Cassandra-based inventory service? Uh, originally, um, when we did it, now, now Inworlds, uh, Cassandra-based inventory is still thrift because we did it, when I um, designed it, CQL was in 1.0. It was just barely out. 0 0.8 was the version of Cassandra that was being run by all the big guys, and so CQL was a baby. So I had designed a thrift-based um, um, one, and that's what we're running now. And that thrift service, I think to learn Cassandra and to implement everything took me about two months, and then there was probably another, like, month of testing and then uh, probably another month of bug fixes after that. Um, but the CQL makes things a lot easier because it's really hard to keep like a bunch of dictionaries and how they're interacting with each other in your head. So CQL makes that a lot better. So 
probably if, if I were to like this, uh, this, imp this presentation took me about, I don't know, probably 40 to 50 hours to do. And it's a fully functional, um, fully functional inventory system. I have all unit tests for moving items and deleting and purging and all sorts of other good stuff in there. So it's basically ready to go. Um, so, uh, how do you configure? Okay, how about binary data? Yes, you can store binary. It's a data type in CQL, so no, no worries about binary. Now, if you have to store huge giant blobs, you have to remember that Cassandra is going to read it all into memory first before it sends it over the network. So, um, you don't want to create a gigabyte, uh, gigabyte blob and then try to read it because you're going to probably uh, create an uh, out of memory condition on the server. Uh, so, you want to split uh, huge binary blobs up. Uh, into chunks. So if it's small though, if it's, you know, you're talking like 16, 64K, you know, under a megabyte, you can pretty much just jam it into a, into a column and be done. So, um, so next question, how to configure the nodes to know about each other? Is there a master server? No, here's something really cool about Cassandra guys. There's no masters, there's no special roles on any server, okay? So every server is equal. So you don't have to worry about configuring like this server as uh, like a special, this is like, this is like the, the, the server that knows everything and these servers are kind of the babies that don't know anything. Cassandra doesn't work like that, everything's equal. So um, what you do is you create a cluster and then you tell each of the nodes in the cluster, what are you give them what are called seed nodes. So like, say you know that your base Cassandra cluster is four nodes out of eight, okay? So your first four nodes become seed nodes. And then those nodes talk to each other to figure out the uh, configuration of the cluster. That's it. They have, they gossip to each other, they figure out how the cluster's built, they figure out who owns what, and boom, they're done. Um, it, when you add nodes, it's the same way. You just specify a cluster name, uh, you add the node, you tell it what its seed nodes are, it's gonna grab the configuration, everything else from the other nodes and start going as soon as it's bootstrapped. And this stuff happens fast. I put up, um, I moved, uh, um, let's see, we went from four to eight node Cassandra cluster, and uh, I put up four nodes in about an hour and nobody noticed, like it was so cool. And these nodes just, they just do what they're supposed to. They talk to each other, they figure things out and your, your cluster starts moving. So it's really awesome. Um, can SQL be converted to CQL? Uh, not directly, you, you definitely wanna understand how Cassandra works uh, on the inside before you just start writing some CQL because you don't wanna end up writing uh, an inefficient implementation. So it's definitely, um, it's definitely worth your time to understand the implementation and then start writing some CQL, but you'll notice how similar CQL is to SQL. And so that allows you to convert back and forth pretty easy. Uh, how easy it is to add new columns. Very easy, there's an alter table statement just like um, just like you're used to. And it does not, it's not like MySQL on InnoDB and the others where you add a column, it's gotta rebuild the table. It doesn't like destroy your cluster while it's working. It just works, so it's really cool. Um, does the Cassandra cluster rebalance? Yes, when you add nodes, um, the Cassandra cluster automatically rebalances your data. It shuffles the stuff around and, and uh, based on the partition keys, it moves data around to the nodes uh, where they belong. So yes, it does automatically rebalance. Now, the cool thing is if you double the size of your cluster, um, you don't have any shuffling um, to do besides for draining old data from uh, nodes that no longer handle it. So if you go from like two to four, well, two doesn't make a lot of sense, but let's say three to six. Um, the data that's currently on those three nodes, half of the data is gonna go to the new nodes. And then you will actually, you'll see the disk space free from that happen. If you just add like a single node, then all the, all the nodes have to sort of rebalance because it, it affects the entire range. So uh, you'll see data moving around and stuff like that. But um, doubling, doubling, adding twice as many, like going from uh, three to six and six to 12, uh, it actually is pretty easy for Cassandra to move the data around. And now it's actually even easier because um, Cassandra uses V nodes. Yeah, so, so that's a little bit of a dated uh, information that I'm giving you because Cassandra now uses V nodes, which means that it sort of automatically, um, even if you just add a single server, it will partition the ranges and uh, sort of make sure that there's no hotspots and stuff. So definitely check out the docs on V nodes and how that works because uh, they're pretty cool. But right now we're, we're still using the original uh, design, which was just you pick the key, you divide the 128 bit space into X uh, or N nodes, and then you pick the, the keys and they're each responsible for their ranges. So, uh, but V nodes make that a little bit easier uh, and it will automatically, just adding a single server, it will figure out how to, how to partition the data, move it around, so. Um, all right, so 
I haven't seen any questions in a little bit, so thanks for coming. Um, you can find the full source code with unit test coverage. It's on uh, GitHub at uh, github.com slash inworlds uh, slash opensim CQL inventory. Um, and uh, if you go there, you'll see the entire um, uh, you'll see the entire bits of source code there, and it's all workable. It all works, um, and you can go ahead and do what you want with it. It's under the BSD license, which should be entirely compatible with the BSD license. Uh, so, <laughs> so do what you want with it, and uh, have fun. And hopefully, um, we can start to see some more Cassandra solutions start coming out because the, the tell, trust me, they're not going anywhere. Um, especially data stacks, they have some big customers and the Fortune. Uh, Fortune 100s and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, so good stuff. Um, you can reach me if you have uh, any other questions. Um, uh, probably via GitHub, and um, just let me know. So, thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you, David, for a terrific presentation. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Following this session at 11 a.m., we have a break in the schedule for lunch or dinner wherever you may be in the physical world. In addition, if you're a crowd funder at the exclusive access level or, or above, you are invited to a VIP Q question and answer session with today's keynote speakers in the staff zone audit auditorium at 11 a.m. Finally, we'll return after the lunch break for an hour exploring the conference grid from 12 noon Pacific until 12.45. If you haven't yet had a chance to visit the Expo regions or play the Open MetaQuest game, this will be your chance. Thank you again to our speaker and the audience. We'll be back after lunch. Have a great break.